five, four, three, two, one. Let's go. Diary of a Kitty Warrior. Sharing faith, knowledge, hope, and love. Hi, and welcome to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. My name is Dee Moore, and I am a stage four kidney warrior. This podcast is dedicated to encourage, educate, and inspire as we explore all aspects of kidney disease, chronic illnesses, and health. If you have any questions or ideas for future topics you would like me to cover, please do get in contact with me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. In today's episode, we are talking about chronic illness and mental health. Joining me today is my special guest, Dr. Delroy Hall. Dr. Delroy Hall is a psychodynamic psychotherapist. He is a senior counsellor and well-being practitioner at Sheffield Hallam University UK and is developing a private consultancy. Dr. Hall has given lectures at Harvard University, Boston College, Massachusetts, USA, and Durham University, UK. He has also taught at Leeds Beckett University and was appointed as club chaplain for Sheffield United Football Club in September 2017. His main focus is dealing with loss and grief, depression, anxiety and clergy stress. And primarily, Dr. Hall is committed to dealing with human pain whilst developing trust so people can recover and thrive. Outside of his emotional and psychological concerns of human well-being, Dr. Hall is an active leader in his community and triathlete. Dr. Hall is married to Paulette and has two twin daughters, Saffron and Jordan. Hi and welcome to Diary of a Kidney Warrior, the podcast. How are you doing today, Dr. Hall? I'm pretty good, Dean, and thank you much indeed for the invitation. I've uh, been looking forward to it and hope that it's uh, been an interesting night. And, you know, it's my honour and privilege to have you here. Um, thank you. And, you know, thank you so much for sharing your time and, and experience. And um, I know there's going to be so much that everyone can learn from you today. Um mm-hmm. In my introduction, I said that you are a psychodynamic psychotherapist. So right. what is a psychodynamic psychotherapist? Okay, sounds really posh, but it's not really. Um, I'm a someone who works with human beings, but very interested in people's history. So birth, early childhood, adolescence, and how their experiences have shaped the present. Um, so that, that helps me certainly in the first couple of sessions when I'm meeting somebody and doing a lot, asking a lot of questions about earlier, earlier stuff, experiences, traumas, events. It helps me to paint a picture of what's happening now. But also for them, sometimes they've never really spoken about their experiences. It's been in their heads um, that they kind of talk about it. So really interested in past experiences, also interested in the unconscious how that influences people in the present and then kind of projecting to the future. Right. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. No, I, I think so. So I've got a scenario for you. So you, someone's feeling unwell. They go to their doctor who does some tests and then they're spe- sent to a specialist. They may, well, in some cases, they may have had, you know, lots of symptoms or for some people, they don't have any symptoms at all. But for some reason, they've had a blood test and the, the doctor sends them off to the specialist and the specialist drops the bomb on them and says that they're diagnosed with a chronic illness, in this case, um, kidney disease. Um, speaking from, you know, a counselling perspective, what would you suggest? What what happens next? Okay, I think your description was really apt because you spoke about dropped a bomb. And if you imagine dropping the bomb and the devastation, now we can talk about bombs that don't explode, but we're talking about bombs that explode. Um, there's nothing but devastation. So um, using that, it, that um, imagery that you're the, the dropping the bomb and a lot of work I'm doing around COVID at the moment, um, one of the friends, use is um, an idea from a Chinese um, counselling psychologist called fluid. Uh, so COVID-19 has come along, disrupted everything. So fluid, F-L-U-I-D, F for fear, 
L for loss, U for uncertainty, I for insecurity, D for doubt. Even though this is about COVID-19, but actually it fits exactly what you would experience when you hear this bombshell. But you've gone on and your life has been pretty healthy. And most of us, if something is wrong with us or doesn't feel quite right, we're hoping for the best, but sometimes we're kind of fearing the worst. And then we hear this news and what it does, it just knocks our life out of orbit. So then we are left for some time picking up the pieces. So this whole thing about fear, what's going to happen, how can I deal with this, the whole thing about loss, how is life going to be? Um, and if it's major kidney um, um, a disease, it means in a sense we can't go back to normal. Lots of uncertainty about the future, lots of insecurity, lots of doubt. Will I live? Will I not? And all that type of thing. So um, to start off with, huge devastation, loss, panic, fear, terror, anything negative you can think of initially when it happens. Well, there's two things really. There's one of denial and then there's this whole thing about um, the devastation. So I don't know, you know, most patients, if they hear that, they, they might say something to the doctor, oh, you're joking. The doctor's not joking. You can tell by his face he's not joking. So there, there can be that initial kind of denial, and then there's this kind of huge shock. So how does how does that person begin to move past? Like, So we talk about the, the F in the word, the acronym FLUID. How do they start to deal with the fear? Well, first thing they have to do, um, as difficult it is, uh, well, one of the things about dealing with unpleasant emotions is actually about it's, it is about acknowledging it. One of the worst things we can do, uh, so so you're unwell already. Worst things we can do, one of the worst things we can do when we have unpleasant emotions is to suppress them. Because all suppressing emotion does is causes more damage to well, it causes damage, so um migraines and all the rest and so forth. But also what one of the things that um suppressed emotion does it messes up with the immune system your immune system is already compromised by suppressing emotions you compromise it even further the immune system is called the floating brain so it's made up of white cells red cells bone marrow um, uh, tonsils um, as a spleen various aspects of our body which we can't see but together working in harmony it's called the floating brain so it communicates with uh, communicates with the brain in kind of giving the brain um, signals, you know, for the brain to do certain things. If that's compromised, then it just means that we're open to illnesses and so forth. So the first thing that we can do, as difficult as it is, is to acknowledge how we feel, accept this is the situation, this is it, this is real. Worrying, even though that's natural, is not going to change it. So the first thing is acceptance, and that can that can take some time. Um, certainly if you're sporty, you're energetic, your life, you know, you're living in the fast lane and life is, you know, going well and, and up to that point you've been keep, keeping good health. Um, accepting it can be really difficult. It can be terrible to get to. But once we get to that, then we can start putting things into place. Now, how long people get to that is just dependent on a load of things, their mental attitude, what they're like normally. You've got somebody who bottles feelings it might take a long time for them to get there you've got somebody who's kind of quite exuberant out there deal with stuff in a kind of kind of mature way or a different way that they can arrive there kind of quite quickly so it just depends on the individual personality the environment um getting to that place and then beginning to take steps now to take control of their life so i know that you you help people deal with loss and grief. So if we look mm-hmm. at the, the L in the word fluid, loss, mm-hmm. how do you come to terms with loss? And when my understanding, when I hear the word loss is, I've, I've lost my life as I knew it. It's like the, 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 the dream, the stuff that I took for granted, the things that I would be able to do or eat or drink you know simple things like that the loss of sure. normality is, sure. is is that the type of thing that you mean 
Uh, yeah, um, I think loss, um, sometimes we think of loss only when somebody dies, but actually, no, loss is huge. So the whole thing around the kidneys, whole thing around COVID-19, people have lost, not just lost their jobs, so with, jo- with the job comes status, importance, identity. Um, so loss is huge. So in terms of your, you know, the illness, you know, kind of kidney disease, see, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate, as far as I know, I've not got it. So somebody who loses normal function of their life there's loads of losses as you rightly said the things that you normally eat um you, you, you can't eat them anymore you can't even taste them so the thing about again about acceptance is grieving the loss i used to be able to do it i can't do it anymore and there's a real emo- well emotional psychological biological relational spiritual impact when something major happens so it's not just one thing. Quite often doctors, and I guess, you know, the focus on the physical aspect. So the focus on the body. Uh, but I'm aware, as I've been, been informed, of kind of renal psychologists who will deal with, you know, interventions, the, the, uh, the, the psychological well-being of the person. I would deal with emotion and psychological well-being. Somebody from a religious background, how does this, does this affect the person spiritually? It's, it's, it's a huge thing, and it's grieving that process, you know, going through the process, grieving the loss, again, arriving at a place of acceptance, which takes time. And then the next thing, I, I suspect that you've not even had a chance to touch the ground, and you're off having loads of tests, and the doctor's going to have to do this to you, and they're going to have to do that to you. You're perhaps hoping to go to work the following day, and you're in hospital and you might be in for two or three days. So your whole life is disrupted. Um, so it's not surprising if people were normally quite placid, hit low moods, depression. But if with the right support, and not necessarily a counsellor or a psychologist or a therapist, but the right support, people who walk with them, they can get through it. Um, I've been a believer for years, as much as I'm a therapist, and I've been a pastor for X amount of years, I, I believe that, that we can get through most things in life if we have the right people around us. And we don't need an army, just two or three people who will walk with us, who won't judge us, who will allow us to be moody, who will allow us to be vexed. And from a Pentecostal background, you know, we don't swear, but actually if somebody drops a few swear words in terms of the process of getting to where they need to get to, they'll not be judged for it. So you just need a few people around you who will help you through that process. So in terms of the saying again about the loss and, you know, when you were saying about the grieving process, within that, mm-hmm. that loss process, is it very similar to the grieving process where you, what is it, the, what is it, anger, bargaining, denial? That's, yeah, yeah, same thing, same thing. Um, so in terms of um, the, the kind of the grief process, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, 1969, she, she kind of devised these five stages because she worked a lot with terminally ill patients. Now, it's been worked on a bit. Some people say it's five stages, some people seven. But one of the things that she said before she died was that, that she wasn't trying to sanitise the process because she says grieving is really messy. And I think at one time people believe, well, first it's denial, shock, uh, bargaining, anger, depression, acceptance. But there's, there's an understanding now people can kind of go from one state to the next, it kind of oscillates, and it's not, you know, it's not uh, compartmentalised, but it can go backwards and forwards. Um, so grieving, when you've lost something which has been really important, in this case health, job, what it might be, it's really important, the process of going to acceptance is quite messy, painful, agonising, sleepless nights, can't eat your food. Somebody, for example, who might look after themselves really well, stop looking after themselves. You know, you might see a woman who would, would never leave the house, um, you know, looking untidy. She may leave the house looking kind of unkempt, um, might not look after herself very well or, or, or himself. So it, it affects us in, in, in various ways. But it's, it's, it can be a long process. Yeah. So I guess it's really being okay with not being okay. Spot on, absolutely. 
Yeah, and I think um, that's a kind of buzzword. I've heard that reese I've kind of never heard that much. I suppose we're doing the counselling world, but since COVID-19, I've heard that quite a lot. And actually, yeah, when things happen in our lives and it's traumatised us, again, a word that's used so, so popular now, but when our our normal life has been disrupted significantly, um, if anybody's been, uh, as an example, if anybody's been punched in the solar plexus, that's the top part of the stomach, you know for a few minutes you can't breathe, you, you lose control of everything, and, and you're gasping for air. In one sense, when you lose something really important, uh, whether it be job, health, whatever, that's how it affects you. You are left all at sea for quite some time. So what is one way? What I mean, I know it's a you can't just bring it to one sentence something you know sure. therapy and i know it's a lot more complicated oh, than that what, yeah sure um but what is one way that a person can start on that you know to start that process of coming to terms with it okay one of the, one of the ways i really encu- you know there's, there's there's quite a few ways but one of the ways i really um encourage people start to do is to start to write or to journal um there's been lots of research now on the impact of writing when people are anxious when people are depressed when people are suffering with ibs people covering from operations the whole process of writing writing more so pen and paper more so than computer um so that is a way and i think when i've done work i'm doing some work at the moment with the nhs and and one of the um, things of dealing with uncertainty is, is to journal. And one of the things I do know, for lots of adults, when they were young, they wrote poems and short stories. And for many, they stopped it along the way. Yeah, you know, they, they stopped it along the way. But actually, what I've said to people, get your pen out and start writing again. Start write, writing poetry. Start keeping a journal. Start writing short stories. And maybe you can use the short story to talk about your illness in, in, in a kind of what called cathartic way, process of writing can alleviate a lot of anxiety. So I'm just a, um, I've been a journalist since nine, September 1999 and I'm still journaling today, 21 years on. And I've said to people that if I'd not learned how to journal, I think I would have been hospitalised quite a few times because writing just helped me to deal with some, some madness that was going on in my head. I couldn't articulate in words what I was feeling. Sometimes it was to do with I'm not having enough holidays, I was under a lot of stress and so forth. But the process of writing really helped me to slow down and to think what's kind of taking place. Um, so, so one of the one of the um, uh, exercises I could suggest um, with somebody who has a terminal ill uh, sorry, not terminal, well, yes, terminal illness or you know, kidney disease or anything is actually. Um, write as though you're having a conversation with it. Okay. So, so, right, so, so it's called paper dialogue. So I'll give you an example. When I was doing my PhD, it was really hard, really, really hard. So I thought, right, then, look, let me find a way to – really, I was looking for an easier way. And um, so I set up this paper dialogue. So we've got PhD and me. So we enter into this, this fictitious conversation. It starts off fictitious, but there's a kind of level of reality – and uh, it went on for about four pages. And I remember, I'll never forget it, it concluded by the PhD kind of responding to me, Delroy, I'm not moving, you need to step up. And that was then, so, so there's no back door. <laughs> so I had to do the hard work. So maybe you can have a paper conversation with the part of your body that's not functioning well. Um, so when I had a massive outbreak of eczema two years ago, I started writing, having a conversation with my skin. So maybe you can have a conversation with your kidney or your heart or your liver or, or your leg or, or your eyesight or your ears. It's, it's a way of entering into a conversation. Why are you treating me like this and all that type of thing? So, and it's, it's kind of fun to do. Um, and some, some, some people might be listening thinking, oh, gosh, well, I've known from time therapists was crazy. And he had a <laughs> More crazy than I thought. But, you know, give it a go. Um, if there's an excellent book. Um, in terms of introduction to journaling called Journal to the Self by Kathleen Adams. 
it's a very accessible book. There's 20 different, well, she's got 22 different ways of journaling, but actually there's more than that. But it's just a very powerful way of beginning to engage with unpleasant stuff in life. Fascinating. Um, I really like the idea of that. Um, me personally, I'm, I'm a creative, so I, I songwrite yeah. and I, I write poetry and I, I do kind of talk to different subjects um, when yeah. I'm writing my poetry. So actually, sure. I, I, I think I'd like to give that a try and, and see... Yeah. You know what can yeah. what can come from that because yeah, absolutely, and it's it's amazing because you, you you know you'll see you'll see some insights that you know that just by maybe just talking about it you just wouldn't see, but you know again the process of writing just slows it down, so you kind of connect with things that a bit beneath the surface. So, is there a reason why you recommend to pen and paper as opposed to? typing because obviously this gen this technological God. generation we're typing is that to do with the ty- the part of the brain that it activates when you're handwriting um possibly i've i've not i guess if you ask me the question maybe i need to look at it what happens kind of psychologically but also i do have a confession to make i still handwrite letters to people right. um an old-fashioned dude you know if i'm going to uh if um i yeah obviously i use emails if I'm going to write a personal letter, I can't remember ever writing a personal email. Yes, one person in Jamaica um, writing a personal email. Otherwise, when I write letters, uh, yeah, so when I contact people, I write letters. And somebody spoke to me recently. They've got a letter that I wrote to them in the early 80s. They've still got it. Okay. And I can't remember what I wrote. Um, I wrote. In fact, I wrote my mother a few years ago, just thanking her for being my mum and blah blah blah. I can't. I can't, again, I can't remember what I wrote, but she said she wants a letter read at her funeral. I can't. That's really so, sweet. You know, just just said you know for thanking her for being my mum and blah 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 blah. And yeah, so so handwriting, and I think certainly now in this time when people are lots of people people feel isolated. If you know of individuals, you just write them a, a short letter. It doesn't have to be long. You know, it's so rare these days, but it does. It gives people a lot of um, encouragement. Um, as, as you know, in the, in, in the introduction, I'm the chaplain for Sheffield United Football Club. That's how I contact the players. I promised them I would never get into their business, and I write them letters, and they are so grateful for it because they don't have that type of communication from anybody now. Um, so letter writing is really important. So the I in the word fluid um, yeah. is insecurity. Yeah. So tell me more about that. Insecurity, um, well, I guess it links a little bit with um, uncer- uncertainty quite often to do with the future, but insecurity me- also means what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my life? Um, do I have a future? Um, and I think when you're unwell, uh, significantly so, I think though I think we have those ideas all the time. Those thoughts run through our minds, you know. And certainly, if you're told, you know, it's a life-threatening illness, that thing of insecurity is there. Um, you know, um, I, I, obviously, I, we've not spoken at length, but I, I guess at some point when you first heard the news, you know, what's going to happen to me? What will happen to my children? What will happen to my husband? Will I still have a career? Will I still be able to work? All those feelings and thoughts are kind of natural and normal when you first have some devastating news. But then when you kind of settle yourself a bit and kind of get the reins of your life a little bit, right, okay, all right, well, actually, I don't know for sure, but you know what, I'm going to do as much as I can about it. And and that that is it. I mean, in terms of my own journey, um, when, you know, at first when I first became ill, for me, it was like I'd been ill, seriously ill before, and it was something mm-hmm. that I came through. And so I was yeah. expecting that this was going to be the same. Sure. So, you sure, know, sure. I'm, I'm ill now, but, you know, I'll get over it and I'll be fine. Mm-hmm. But as time progressed and it was clear that I was not going to get better, then I was sure, confront, sure. confronted with, oh, my gosh, this isn't going to go away. Um, sure, sure. Um, this is This is changing my life now. And yeah. that kind of process of coming to terms with with it and I did go through a period of uh, I'm like okay I have to prepare for worst case scenario and Mm -hmm. I 
decluttered my house and I was having a certain conversation with with my friends and saying if this happens and they were quite mm-hmm. upset with me and they're like you're not going anywhere like they stopped talking like this and I said well I just I think for me it was like I just was like well if I'm wrong you know best case scenario my house is cl- decluttered <laughs> you know yeah, it, course, it, it yeah, was course. it was kind of um that I kind of had that attitude to, towards mm-hmm. it but it um as time as time went on and and uh, you know I was kind of looking at am I going to be here you know am I going to live and that kind of switched to well I want to be here and I want to live and I'm going to do what I can to help myself and I think the more I kind of um focused on that in terms of what was happening to me um instead of focusing on what was happening to me I started focusing on what I could do um that's when I started to feel better and that's when I started to feel empowered within myself and I think that's when the warrior you know where I really could take on that um title warrior because that's when I I was really defiant and saying no I'm gonna fight this and I'm gonna do what I can do to help myself Mm -hmm. so um yeah I've definitely um can relate to that feeling of insecurity and then coming to the point where I learned to turn it on its head Mm -hmm. absolutely so the next letter is the D for doubt. Mm-hmm. So how do, how would you, I mean, that was my way of coming to terms with the doubts that I had, but sure. what, other, what kind of strategies would you recommend? Well, for, I guess for uncertainty and insecurity and doubt is that, uh, well, certainly it's interesting that when you look at, if you, if you kind of Google doubt, and kind of look at, it's, it's usually uh, referred to people of faith, um, and even, and if there's any people, anybody kind of listening who has a, a faith, you know, that sometimes when we have these real kind of devastating blows on our life, that it, it can knock our faith. Actually, faith doesn't mean, unbe- sorry, doubt doesn't mean unbelief. But actually what doubt can do, doubt can lead to stronger faith. Um, so so one of the things that you we, we can do where we have some control over, and I think you, you, you would have done this, and many people have done this, Again, another book I'd encourage people to read, um, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist, but he was in a prison war camp. He was in four prison war camps, and he noticed something significant. People who are optimistic, you know, so for example, you know, by Easter we'll be out, by, by Christmas we'll be out. What happened? They were disappointed so much that they died. But the people who who um, survived, him included, people in their memories were thinking, not so much of when we'll be out, but think of being with their family again. No, 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 no time on it, but thinking when they would be there with their families. And what he did, he imagined himself giving lectures and so forth while he was stuck in the prison camp. So I think what you would have done and other people, the thing is called kind of visualisation. And I think as you were talking that, we cannot underestimate the power of the mind. You know, the power that the mind has, not to free you of your, of your, of your illness, but just to put a different perspective on what's happening and give you hope. Because I think one of the things that, what we're really saying in terms of doubt, one of the responses is having hope. So it could be that you're right in the middle of this thing and you've been given the news, but actually you come to a point whereby, no, I'm going to take some control over my life. There's lots of things I can't control, but these are some of the things I can, can control. One of the things that we can do, we, we can start to think of what might my future be? So that is very different from, oh, I'm going to die. You know, my, um, that's, that's a different thing altogether. And I think, with our minds, um, I'm not an endocrinologist, but what, but what I do know that if we start thinking positively, there are, there are kind of positive hormones that kind of start floating around our bodies. If we start thinking negatively, then, you know, the opposite occurs and we don't, we, you know, we can't see a way forward. And it's not about having a positive mental attitude. I think, you know, we're looking at the reality and that's what you did, and what, that's what lots of, of other people do. You look at the reality of what's happening. You're not spiritualizing it or philosophizing it or theorizing about it. 
this is the dreadful situation I'm in, but actually can I with my mind take myself from this present situation and imagine what life could be like in a year or two's time? I think the mind for for my there's two examples that I have that that really um highlights the point that you've just made and that's um I know two people um that were diagnosed with cancer and they were they were both given two weeks to live mm. and one died two weeks later the other one died eight months later mm. and although they both died the f- the first one who died two weeks later, when he was told that he had two weeks to live, he immediately stopped speaking, stopped eating, and he gave up, and he died two weeks later. Mm. The other person, she said, "I'm not going anywhere. I'm fighting mm. this," and she w- and she was defiant, and she she said, "No," nope, and she wouldn't accept it, and and like I said, she lived a lot longer, mm. and that's. Yep. Seeing that showed me, you know, right in front of my eyes, seeing it for myself, I saw the difference. And for me, the mind, you know, the the body follows the mind in that way. If you just give up and just say, oh, that's it, it's all over, then chances mm-hmm. are it will be. Because as you said, um, you know, the, the effect that it has on the, the mental, um, let me get my words right. <laughs> When your when your mind is consumed with that negativity, when your mind is focused on "I'm going to die," this, that, and the other, your immunity shuts down, your your body shuts mm-hmm. down, and it has a physical Absolutely impact. Correct. Whereas yeah. if you focus your mind on, like you said, I'm, "I've got a future," and and you're not, I guess, by putting a timeline on it as well, it's it's a, it's adding a stress because you're yes. if it doesn't happen within that timeline, then it's going to have a negative effect. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. having a wide wide open, wide plan and saying sure. the future, I can see how that that is so much more effective and, and so, mm. you know, I'm so into speaking life, I'm so into, you know, focusing on, you know, what can I do, what is in my power to do, you know, how sure. can I, how can I deal with this, so yeah, I, I can see straight away how that would be um, helpful and, and, and would do so much good. I think, you know, some people might be listening, and, and, and just go back to your, your example of the two individuals, well, they could say, well, actually, you know, the person, you know, died eight months later, but that's what the person had, because their mindset was different, they had time. Yes. That they had time whereby they could settle settle stuff if they needed to. So, you know, so as I said earlier on, it's not a case of, the, you know, if you have a positive mindset, you know, it, 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 it kind of deals with all that stuff but it just puts a different spin on your life. And the person who was able to live for another eight months was then able to, I'm sure, well, I don't know, but, they, you know, they would have had time to either say goodbyes and all the rest of it. The other person who spoke, he, he or she, um, two weeks, stopped talking, stopped communicating, but at least this person who had eight months had time to either spend with the family, to have, just have a good time before, you know, the, the um, end finally came so but the mind's really important very important indeed i mean one of the things that um that i say that, that was said to me is choosing to live i choose to live and i think that like you said and i'm a firm believer that even a person who has a day to live can choose to live that day to the full mm. or they can yeah, fold yeah. up their arms and they can say, I've got a day to live and just give up and spend that yeah. those hours doing nothing. Yeah, so, of course. Absolutely. So I really believe that, you know, we have to make the choice to live. And although it might not change our diagnosis, I, re- mm. I strongly believe that it can change our quality of life. Hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, you know, for people who are listening, I think anything, you know, do do a bit of work and research around, you know, use, using our minds, Um you know, the mind is really, really powerful. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of people. I, the person that comes to mind, a guy called Joe Dispenza, who, who I think was in, I think it was car accident or something like that. Who was in a really bad way, but he recovered. Uh, very interesting guy to listen to. Um, but you know, I would always say, you know, seek medical advice, seek science because it's there. Um, but science can't answer everything. Good as it is, can't answer everything. Um, and the big clash in the world of psychotherapy 
and, and, and science at one time was, is psychotherapy art of science? It's this kind of long conversation. But I think they actually complement each other. Not One is not better than the other. So I use science to understand things, but also I also know that human beings are incredibly creative and there's no limit to what we can do, really. Um, it's about against our minds. Now, I'm aware that people from the BME community are less likely to access psychological support. Do you have any thoughts as to why this may be the case? Yeah, I, th- I think, again, it's, it's, never, it's never one thing. I think by the time we get to the doctors, we're usually really unwell. And, um, and I th- I th- oh, gosh, yeah, it's quite a few things. Culturally, certainly as men, you know, we just kind of get on with stuff, you know, men talk to man up. Um, there's a, there was a, a research that was done at University of London, um, Holly, um, Holloway, the University of London, and they they done a study, I think it's finished last year, looking at social recovery for African and African Caribbean men in terms of mental illness. One of the things that came up from the study was the men said that this macho image contributed to their psychological breakdown and psychosis, this thing about manning up and all that type of stuff. So uh, manning up doesn't help. And when women as well, certainly, be, you know, just kind of kind of press on, looking after children, looking after the house, you've got jobs, kind of keep going on. So we ignore the signs and the pains and the aches in our bodies. And then by the time we get to the doctors, quite often we've had a crisis. And sometimes for the cri- if we get through the crisis, sometimes it's the best thing that's ever happened to us because then we can reassess our lives. But then some crises are worse than others. So that's one thing in terms of so this cultural stuff. I think also there is still a mistrust amongst our community with um, psycho- psychological therapies offered by the, the kind of mainstream. Quite often, uh, psychologists are taught Eurocentric uh, ways, which we don't fit into. So therefore, something that I might see as something very cultural might be misdiagnosed as something, you know, some on some mental health thing. So, and I think most of us know people who, who've been to see a psychiatrist and they've re- they've reinterpreted a normal behaviour, and then the next thing we're taking, you know, strong drugs and all the rest of it. So I think there's a few things really. Um, I'm not too sure. Um, I know there's IAPT improved access to psychological therapies, but I'm not too sure how effective. It's a huge weight in this now. I'm not too sure how effective it is for people from the BME community. Um, but also, what I will say, um, um, that there's been lots of research that's been done already. And it wouldn't surprise me if they'd spend another few more million on more research. And I think the BME community is actually fed up and researched out. The documentation is there already. Um, so quite often, it's the lack of will to think about, okay, psychological therapies, but can we look at other perspectives or other ways of dealing with or working with people that are not like us? I'm talking about the mainstream people. now. So, so by the time we get there, we're incredibly unwell, um, and then we can't function very well for um, psychotherapy or counselling, so it's not offered to us. Um, we're then quite often given stronger medication. That's still a fact. Um, so, and that that messes us up even more. So you only need to know two or three of your friends who've had that experience and you won't want to go. Um, but I think there's lots that lots we can do to prevent ourselves getting into that place. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's just my kind of take on it. And also I think, I think, yeah, I, I'll say it anyway, I just think we're very mistrusting of... Um, the kind of uh, mainstream psychologists and therapists and so forth. So how yeah, do you I, think that we can bridge that gap and overcome that mistrust? Well, if I, if, if I, knew, if I knew the answer, I think I'd be chief exec of the <laughs> National Health Service and I'd be on a million pound a minute, I think. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I th- well, I think, um, gosh, you're gonna, I'm going to say something now which some people might not agree with. I'm not too sure about this unconscious bias training. I think it's a money scam. I'll be honest. Um, I think what has to take place is 
people who've developed these ideas and theories and using them wholesale have to sit back and, and really rethink and say, well, is, is this being effective? Look at, look at the results that you're finding and actually asking the question, is there another way we can do this and not shove everybody down a kind of conveyor belt because we're not all the same. Mm. So this idea, you know, this, I think somebody said that BAME means same. No, it doesn't. Um, I'm a Caribbean guy and, um, and I'm 61. I have never built a spliff ever. <laughs> never. I've never built one. I've never grown, I've never had deadlocks. And when I was 16, 17, 18, I like reggae, but I was also into Pink Floyd and Genesis and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Now, there's an assumption that all black guys, we just like reggae. Well, no, we don't. You know, so, you know we're, we're all kind of different. So then it's, like, yes, so you've got your models then. So and how do you then, you know, you see a black guy, Asian guy, African guy, Somalian, some, we're not all the same. But there's an assumption that we're the same. And actually, we're not very, very different. So then how do we apply models? That's one. And then you're the white practitioner, how comfortable is he or her dealing with somebody who don't look like that? Because I think all these things, I know when I had, um, when, I, when I was doing my psychotherapy chain and I had a, <laughs> well, all, all my therapists were white, my white therapists. And um, when I spoke about race, he went pink because I had to stop talking about race. Because he had no experience. He told me, he said he has no experience. The only, he was a guy in his, I was, I was in my 30s then. He would have been in his 60s. And he only had one experience of being minority when he was in Boston. He had to walk into a shop, all black people. I was, and, and he was, he found it a bit uncomfortable, but he was, you know, soon out of the shop. Um, and when I spoke about race on two or three occasions, he was decidedly pink. So I just stopped talking about it. So as psychologists, therapists, how comfortable are you working with somebody who doesn't look like you? Um, I, I've written about it, and the, there's, a, there's a book that's meant to come out early on this year, but they've shifted the, um, shifted the publication date. And really talking about, you know, white clinicians have to do what I call inner excavation. You need to look at your own biases and prejudices that are not always unconscious, they're there. And how can you work on yourself so that you can deal comfortably with somebody who doesn't look like you? So there's so a I lot there's a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot there that um both sides really have to look at. If mm. if the patient is gonna be in a position to trust um the medical profession. Then the medical profession needs to be prepared to to look within yeah. and address yeah. the issues that are there. Yeah, yeah. sure. And actually, um, I'd, I'd like to think that psychologists do and therapists do, um, but there was a, a book written. I can't remember the, the author now, um, but he wrote a book called on on learning from the client. So, as a therapist, as a psychologist, clinical psychologist, you know. A human being is not just a set of diagnoses. It's a human being who has gifts, abilities, and so forth. And can you learn from them? Not necessarily to fit into a diagnosis, but can you learn about their humanity and, and, and not just see the person as somebody to fit a diagnosis or not? And that is a really important point at the, at the end of it all. There is a person. At the center, yeah. or you, you're not just your diagnosis. You yeah, are a person, yeah, and sure. an identity. And I guess that's another a big thing. Your identity um, changes when you um, have any form of chronic illness diagnosis. Sure. How does how does a person navigate that? How do you find your identity and all of that? Because it's very easy to lose it. Like, you know, when people are asking you, how are you feeling? And you, you, my answer for a long time was, was tired. And it's almost mm-hmm. like tired became my identity. And D mm-hmm. was lost somewhere down the road. I was now sure. tired instead sure. of D. So how, yeah. do you, how do you get back your identity? Well, I, I guess what you would do now that this has happened, I think it seems to me that your identity might take another form or... It, it'll change somewhat because you can't 
because you can't go on as if there's nothing happening. Um, so I guess for me, um, it depends how experienced you are. I think people can find themselves again through a process of writing, their creative self, or what I've been saying that maybe one of the things that you can do in terms of being in conversation with somebody. So you're feeling really lost, really stuck. And quite often people don't want to talk about certain things to their friends. So I'll be saying that where you go then and see um, a therapist or a counselor who can help you work through some of the stuff that maybe you can't share with your friends fully. Um, because one, they don't just, you know, they don't understand. And, and if anybody's listening who's a counselor, you know that the, you know, the world in which you inhabit as a counselor or a therapist, whatever name you want to describe, it's a very strange world. And if people are not in it, it's a bit like a kind of, it's not a secret society, but there's a, there's, there's a way of understanding how people work and so forth. If people are not in it, they just don't get it. And, um, and understandably so. So in terms of, yeah, as, as you're talking, it's about refinding yourself. Um, I would say that's through a process of being in dialogue with somebody else or the whole process of writing. Um, you know, you know, who am I? And you use the process of writing to, to process some difficult stuff. And one of the things that I would certainly say, and I've certainly done it myself, um, that you, you may want to, so, uh, uh, the disclaimer is always with journaling that people are psychologically on the edge. They'd say we recommend that the journey is not always beneficial, uh, certainly not unsupervised. But if, you know, if, if that's intact, the whole process of writing um, can be a way of re- refinding yourself or discovering a new self. So what what the crisis would have done, um, um, I, th- I think um, I, I, my manager at work asked me to um, do a, uh, develop a seminar on, on um, crisis avoidance. And what crisis can do, um, right, crisis is, is like a form of reset. So we then use the, the, the crisis. So, you know, therapists might say to the person, how are you? And what's happening? And the person might say, you know what, I don't know. I really don't know. And you use that don't know and you start building a new kind of self, really. It takes a bit of time, but that can be done through writing um, and also through reading. Um, I remember there was a, a guy who I, um, it wasn't a, it's a friend, he wasn't a, a client and very bright guy, but just was very, very lost. And um, I recommended book called uh, The Dark Night of the Soul, um, written by, is it Julian of Norwich, I think? It's a real kind of mystic book, and he found it incredibly helpful um, just in terms of kind of giving voice to his kind of lostness of where he was. And uh, I met him a few weeks ago, and uh, he's certainly in a different place. So, again, it's never one thing. It's, I would say, finding yourself in dialogue and Maybe when you're writing, you're in dialogue with paper. The great thing about paper, of course, it doesn't judge you, does it? Mm. If, you, if you write something down on the paper, the paper doesn't say to you, oh, you know, you shouldn't be feeling all that. You can't say that. Who do you think you are? You know, the paper just, just, kind of use, just kind of receives it, but then you can kind of take some stop from that. But also what you can do when you've written it and put it down, you can go back to a few weeks later, a few months later, and then you can kind of see where you were, see where you are now, so. So my my final thing really is about hope. Like for me, um, when someone has hope, again, going back to your mindset and even though your diagnosis is still exactly the same, if you have hope, you still have that, you still have life in many ways, no matter how long you have left to live. Sure. So what would you say is a, you know, a good way to instill hope in someone? Oh, instill hope. Now that's that's a very interesting question. You know, I um, I recall um, working. So sometimes you have to work with clients who have there's no hope. And what I've said to individuals, and I hope this is helpful to you and somebody else. So I work with them, and I'll say, well, can I be your hope? 
until you find hope for yourself. I've never had a client ever say no. Um, and you work, you work with them. Um, it's a really difficult question that you've asked. It's a very good one, though. And I, I can only draw on my kind of counselling experience is that when you kind of get a sense that people are really, they're, they're on the ropes. And you know that if they don't get off the ropes and they stay there long enough, you, you kind of know where it's heading. Um, and I've said, when I've, I've not said it too often, but I've said it a few times in my work. Can I, can I, can I be your hope? until you get to the place where you can have some hope for yourself. And I've always said yes. And for me, when they walk through the door the following week or the following weeks, they're, they're on that journey to finding it. Um, so it's not an overnight job. Um, for some people, you know, um, people who have faith, one prayer, and there's just something that's deposited in them and they can work on it. But we're not all like that. Um, yeah, but I think what I would say definitely the, is walking with people, journeying with people, and being hopeful. Now, um, for for those individuals who have a kind of an active faith, a living faith, um, I don't mean spiritualizing stuff, but you know. Um, you know, God will see you through and all that type of stuff. And person, person ain't there. Um, uh, 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 no, I'm, I'm not going to share. There's a very good book, another book, um, called um, Let Your Life Speak by Parker Palmer. Uh, brilliant book. Um, I've been working on it since May. It's only 100 pages. I've only got to page 70. Um, so I'm reading it very slowly and writing as I, as I read as it speaks to me. And he went through a period of chronic depression. That was his crisis. But what gave him hope, it wasn't the communion that people gave to him or the, or the words that, oh, you know, you're a good writer, you're a good leader. How can we, you know, what gave him hope kind of caused him to be in touch with reality it was a friend called Bill. Bill would come around every afternoon, said very little, would take his shoes and socks off and massage his feet. And that, he said, was the only connection that gave him a level of hope for the future. And obviously, he survived, you know, came out of it and so forth. So it's journeying with people. And um, sometimes it's just not saying, sometimes it's not saying anything, but just sitting with them. And, and if they say anything, they do. If they don't, say very, very little and walk with them. So your presence can be a hope and give them hope. That's very yeah. powerful. Excellent, excellent question. That is excellent question. Excellent question. That's very powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. I really believe that this is going to help so many people. Thank you. Thank you. My final question is how can our listeners get in touch with you online? Okay, online, three ways. Facebook, uh, Dr. Delroy Hall. Um, that's one way. Messenger, of course, is number two. And thirdly, through my website, Del West Consultancy. Del West is D-E-L-W-E-S Consultancy. And you can and it's a Sheffield-based company, and you can contact me through that, those mediums. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank-, Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for listening to Diary of a Kidney Warrior podcast. And don't forget that you can contact me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter using the handle Diary of a Kidney Warrior. Please do subscribe to the podcast and please do tell a friend. New episodes of this podcast are uploaded every other Monday. Until next time, take care and choose to live. Diary of a Kidney Warrior. Sharing faith, knowledge, hope and love.